Hello, my name is Joanna Martin, and I'm a research fellow at Cardiff University. This talk is about insights into ADHD from recent genetic studies and is based on a review article that I've recently co-authored with Christy Burton, Isabel Pacal, and Nina Rothmata. I'll first start with some definitions and epidemiology related to ADHD, and then the bulk of the talk will focus on looking at converging findings from family and twin research, as well as molecular genetic studies. And then I'll conclude with some summary implications and look at future research directions. ADHD is a common childhood onset neurodevelopmental disorder. Typically, it is diagnosed before the age of 12 years or symptoms are present before the age of 12 years. It is characterized by developmentally inappropriate and impairing levels of symptoms of inattention and hyperactivity and impulsivity. And these symptoms need to be present across settings. So typically in children, they'll be present at home and in the school environment. ADHD is diagnosed using either the DSM-5 or the ICD-10. ADHD is common across the globe and across the lifespan. In children, the prevalence is about 5.3%, and boys are about four times more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD than girls. Many children with ADHD continue to experience symptoms that persist into adulthood, and the prevalence of ADHD in adults is about 2.5%. There is a similar ratio of ADHD in men and women with ADHD. Comorbid conditions are very common in ADHD. These include neurodevelopmental, psychiatric, and physical health conditions. On the bottom left plot, you can see that a variety of neurodevelopmental and psychiatric conditions are increased in children with ADHD. And there are some sex differences in this. Similarly, in adults, psychiatric conditions, as well as some somatic conditions like type 2 diabetes and hypertension are increased in adults with ADHD compared to adults without ADHD. And the impairment of ADHD, and along with these co-occurring conditions, does have a huge impact on the lives of individuals with ADHD and their families. So understanding the etiology of this is essential in order to be able to help individuals affected with ADHD. One of the key emerging findings from genetic studies is that ADHD is highly heritable and polygenic. Several decades of twin studies summarized in this graph here suggest that the relative proportion of genetic factors is far, outwe far outweighs the contribution from environmental factors to ADHD risk. The summary of the heritability estimate of tw from twin studies is between 70 to 80%, suggesting that these genetic factors are really important. Recent molecular genetic studies have begun to identify specific genetic risk factors associated for with ADHD. Genome a genome-wide association study has identified 12 risk loci, summarized here using the top single nucleotide polymorphism at each locus, which are spread across the genome. We also know from copy number variant studies that large, rare structural deletions and duplications of whole sections of DNA, uh, known as these CNVs, are also associated with risk of ADHD. But these genetic risk loci are really just the tip of the iceberg. If we look at this Manhattan plot from the recent genome-wide association study, we can see that although there are these 12 risk loci, which we have statistical significant, statistically significant evidence for, there are many risk loci that are high, that are we have um, not got the statistical power yet to detect, but will likely be very important. And collectively, these common variants have a SNP-based heritability of about 22%. There is this gap you can see between the twin heritability and the SNP-based heritability, suggesting that there will be other genetic risk factors, both common and rare, that are yet to be discovered for ADHD. But we can already gain many insights into ADHD based on these emerging genetic findings. First of all, we can tell that ADHD is indeed best classified as a brain-based neurodevelopmental disorder. When we partition the heritability from the common genetic variant analyses, we can see that there is evidence of enrichment in the central nervous system tissues, particularly various brain tissues. Although twin studies do not directly speak to the biological underpinnings of ADHD, we can see that there are genetic there's significant genetic correlation between ADHD and various neurophysiological measures of brain-based activity, such as EEG measures. Common genetic variants also show a genetic correlation with total intracranial or brain volume. Although this is a modest negative genetic correlation, it does suggest that brain is obviously very important with regards to ADHD pathophysiology. Another line of evidence supporting ADHD as a neurodevelopmental disorder is the fact that it shares quite a large proportion of genetic risk with other neurodevelopmental disorders, including autism spectrum disorder, 
and developmental delay, which I'll talk about a little bit further. Another key finding emerging from genetic studies is that clinically diagnosed ADHD shares genetic risk with population traits of ADHD. It's been long considered that ADHD is the extreme end of an underlying distribution of continuous traits in the population. And this, um, we use this uh, binary cutoff to indicate who has a diagnosis and who needs treatment. But really, if we drew this line elsewhere, we would find that ADHD is similarly heritable across different potential definitions of ADHD, supporting this underlying um, distribution of genetic risk. The estimate of um, correlation, genetic correlation between diagnosed ADHD and subthreshold symptoms of ADHD is moderate at about 0.56. And common genetic variant uh, genetic correlation analyses suggest that this is even higher for these common variants, uh, close to 97% um, for ADHD diagnosis and symptoms of ADHD in the general population. ADHD also shares genetic risks with many of those comorbid conditions that it co-occurs with. A recent systematic review and meta-analysis has found that there are moderate genetic correlations between ADHD and various psychiatric symptoms, uh, both in childhood and adulthood and using various assessment methods to measure the symptoms. These genetic correlations extend across neurodevelopmental psychiatric and somatic phenotypes, according to a whole host of emerging studies in the last decade. Some of the strongest genetic correlations are between ADHD and major depressive disorder and autism spectrum disorder. And if we look at the recent genomoid association study results, um, the genetic correlations between ADHD and other phenotypes are vast. They include measures of schooling, like educational attainment, various psychiatric measures, but also measures beyond psychiatric and brain-based traits to things like obesity, um, cancer, insomnia, rheumatoid arthritis, many somatic conditions that often do co-occur. And these shared genetic risks potentially speak to why ADHD is so commonly co-occurring with these conditions. Another key finding that is emerging is that we cannot necessarily consider environmental risk factors as causal for ADHD without exploring potential shared genetic risks. Studies have long observed that smoking during pregnancy is associated with risk of ADHD in a child. <clears throat> However, maternal smoking during pregnancy is not much more strongly associated than paternal smoking during pregnancy, indicating that there might not be intrauterine effects at work here. A clever intro in vitro fertilization design examined the risk of ADHD in offspring of mothers who were related to them and were smoking during pregnancy versus mothers who were unrelated to their offspring uh, through the IVF design and were smoking during pregnancy. <clears throat> and this study found that the association between smoking during pregnancy and offspring ADHD was only present in the related mothers and not in the unrelated mothers, suggesting that there's genetic confounding. And many other designs have also been used, for example, comparing siblings to identify that there is genetic confounding at play. This is also further supported by the recent GWAS, where smoking-based traits are genetically correlated with ADHD, suggesting that smoking during pregnancy may not be a causal risk factor for ADHD in general, but it could just be that there are these shared genetic effects that increase risk of ADHD and smoking, either during pregnancy or not, and that these genetic effects are passed on by mothers who smoke during pregnancy. And this suggests caution in trying to interpret potential environmental risk factors for ADHD. This isn't to say that there are no environmental risk factors for ADHD, just that the weight of evidence needs to be sufficient to deem a factor causal. <clears throat> Another key finding emerging from the recent studies of genetics of ADHD is that genetic factors are very important across development. Twin studies suggest that there is stable heritability across um, childhood, adolescence, and early adulthood, and that a large proportion of these genetic effects are actually uh, stable across time as well. The recent genetic correlation analyses from GWAS suggest that ADHD in children and ADHD in adults shows a high genetic correlation. <clears throat> 
However, there's some evidence that the persistent trajectory of symptoms of ADHD in children in the general population could be linked to a higher genetic burden compared to uh, symptoms that are low, intermediate, or just limited to childhood. And further work is needed to fully understand um, how persistence of ADHD links in. Um, finally, the last finding I'll talk about is the um, fact that there are shared genetic risks between ADHD in males and in females. Early twin and family studies have um, suggested that there could be a differential burden of genetic risk in males and females. Because girls are less likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, they might require a higher genetic burden to have a diagnosis of ADHD. And several twin and family studies have identified that the relatives of girls who are affected with ADHD are at higher risk than the relatives of affected boys with ADHD. However, quantitative and qualitative twin-based analyses have not found any strong evidence of sex-specific genetic effects, so there are no differences in the heritability of ADHD in males and females. <clears throat> Common genetic variant analyses suggest that the genetic correlation between male and female ADHD is very high, not distinguishable from one. And this supports the idea that common genetic variants are, the same common genetic variants are linked to ADHD in males and females. And polygenic risk score and copy number variant studies suggest that there's no difference in genetic burden in ADHD boys and girls. And this does not support the previous family studies. However, there's emerging evidence to suggest that the differential genetic risk in family studies may be linked to other factors, for example, diagnostic and ascertainment biases. So to summarize, emerging genetic studies suggest that ADHD is very highly heritable and polygenic. It is best categorized as a brain-based neurodevelopmental disorder. And the diagnosis appears to share genetic risks with traits of ADHD, as well as various comorbid conditions. It also seems to share genetic risks with some factors that could be considered to be environmental risk factors. And we know that genetic factors are important for ADHD across development and are shared between males and females. These genetic studies give us the potential to leverage these large data sets of people with ADHD and population samples to really understand more about how ADHD symptoms link in with comorbid and related conditions and symptoms. And this gives us potential to increase the sample size for genetic dis discovery and downstream analyses. The broad shared genetic risks across disorders and with environmental risks have also got implications for designing studies and interventions and just a note of caution about um, ascribing causality in these associations. Although genetic studies do not support binary cutoff between presence or absence of ADHD, of course, symptoms of ADHD are insufficient for a diagnosis. There are other clinical features, including impairment from symptoms, and pervasiveness across settings, which need to be taken into consideration. So considering ADHD symptoms for research purposes and re genetic research studies is uh, very well supported, but of course the clinical cutoff is still important for treatment decisions. There are many unanswered questions and I won't go through all of these, so feel free to pause the recording to read through them. But the one thing I'll say is that the emerging large genetic studies of ADHD and childhood and adulthood populations really provide us with um, the tools that we need to be able to address some of these questions and begin to understand even more about ADHD and how it relates to other uh, comorbid phenotypes. Thank you very much for listening and I just also like to thank again my co-authors Christy, Isabella, Nina and also Barbara and Ben who are the co-chairs of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium ADHD Working Group. Thank you.